You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everybody. Al Belowski with another edition of Catholic Mysticism and Spirituality, where we talk about the supernatural aspects of our uh, faith, the mystical aspects of our faith, and also timely topics and all things Catholic. And Today, we're, I think we're going to have an interesting show for you. It's going to be something I don't think uh, we hear too much as Catholics and maybe not even as Christians. Um, it's going to touch on the end times. But we, what I want to do with this show, because of everything that's happening right now in our society, not just in the United States, but certainly everywhere in the world, to talk about something that as I mentioned, Catholics and possibly Christians do not get a lot of. And that is, what about self-defense? The right to protect our lives, those of the innocent. What do we do as Christians trying to live a life that's Christian and yet very much is in the world that we live in? And by this, what I mean is that we're seeing a lot of things, and this is a great understatement, as all of us know, happening in our society right now. Now, here in the United States, we are seeing what, uh, I'm not the only one that certainly feels this, but others are believing that are a cultural revolution and a movement to possibly change the way the government is, change the way the Constitution is, change things basically as we knew it, for all the good and all the bad that has been done, not only now in America, but historically. So we're seeing a lot of violence, a lot of angst, a lot of angerness, not a lot of unity, not a lot of dialogue, and a lot of fear. Whether it's the fear of catching the pandemic or the pandemic comes back in the fall or whenever it uh, returns, what will happen then? Do we shut the country down? Um, What happens if we lose this freedom, that freedom? There's just a lot going on. You know, parents are wondering if the schools will open in the fall. If they're working a couple jobs, that certainly becomes a big issue for them. And many of us are beginning to wonder, will we ever go back to what we knew just three months ago? Will there be intrusions? They're talking about a vaccination for everyone in the world and a tracing system. And will that be a tremendous infringement on people's liberties here in the United States? There's a lot of stuff going around. And a lot of it is just, you know, a lot of theory, a lot of, you know, junk, in other words. Um, So we've got to be, again, we've mentioned this in many shows, especially dealing with the mystical discernment. So today, while we will be talking about some end time things, we're going to talk about some practical things in self-defense and what the church teaches about self-defense. And uh, we'll get to that uh, very shortly. But right now, I just want to um, bring into... As we dig into this aspect of the show, you know, with all these events happening, and we know that one generation in a particular time is going to go through the cataclysmic events of the second coming of Christ. That is the judgment day, where all we know will end, and only heaven and hell will exist, and we will live somewhere forever. And Lord, we pray and willing, we offer this prayer that it be with you at the end of time and not be with the evil one in torment, but with joy and love in your kingdom forever and ever for us all, for all those listening to the show, for each and every one of us, our families and every soul on this planet. And when you look at the state of affairs in our world right now, many people, and You know, it's hard to avoid this, that Jesus may be returning soon. 
And some people are getting really worked up. We've heard about preppers and those who are building bunkers, those who are selling their homes, moving to deserts, mountain locations, we're stockpiling food, buying weapons. Believe me, they're buying, they're buying weapons. Gun stores have not uh, known such business for a long, 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 long time. And people that are buying these things are very unfamiliar with them. And you, you can see almost this powder keg that can happen. And we're going to talk about some of these things. And, again, stockpiling food, weapons, ammunition, and it goes on and on. And we do have confidence in the Lord. And we live by faith as Christians. We're, you know, trying to live by the Spirit and trying to live with a deeper faith. And in times like this, it's very difficult. People have lost their loved ones. They've lost their livelihoods. You know, it's very difficult. So how do we think about all this thing? Do we head to the hills, bury our heads in the sand, not worry about it at all? Or do we kind of owe up to the task at hand, stay where we are in the area that Jesus put us in, and minister to people around us? Very, very tricky stuff. Very tricky stuff. Now, many, many epics in history have had a lot of things happen. We're going to touch a couple things on that. So one thing I, I want to make clear is that in Jesus' own words, he said that no one knows or can know the day or hour of his return. That's in Matthew, Mark, and Acts. And that's one thing we've got to look at. Okay? So no one, despite all our best guessworks and all the time we look at and investigate these end times uh, philosophies and theologies, and we see the events in our lives, what's happened in the past, what can happen in the future. But remember the key here, that Jesus says no one. No one knows. And, you know, one of the things it talks about in Mark is, as you know, famines, earthquakes, disasters, trouble, persecutions, wars, and the rumors of wars. Well, that's very true. And they can apply right now in the year 2020. But my point I made a moment ago is this has always been happening. Think of it. What if we were Christians? What if we were born under the time frame when Christians were being persecuted under the Rome, Roman emperor, emperors like Nero, Domitian, Caligula? Okay? Christians like St. Philomena and St. Felicity went singing singing into the Colosseum, about to be torn to shreds by animals that were starved to death. And make no mistake about it, you know, we, we sanitize a lot of things that happen. We sanitize uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And that's one of the reasons Mel Gibson's movie was so popular is because it certainly didn't do that. It tried to portray, it probably failed uh, quite a bit so, in what actually happened. But it was brutal enough. And, you know, think of it. Starving animals, maybe one grabs your arm, the other grabs your leg, it becomes a tug of war. Not pretty. What about those at the time of the sack of Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed? And don't forget the barbarian invasion with Attila the Hun. We had the Vikings that came over and sacked and just made a mockery of religion, steal things. How about the Battle of Ponto? And earlier in the year 700, when the Muslim tide almost stamped out Christianity and Charles the Hammer Martel had to stop them from France. You see, we see Genghis Khan, one of the worst plagues we've ever had, the Black Death. It wiped out a third of Europe. We look at the world wars, World War I, World War II, the death camps. It's so easy to go back and look if we see this and to realize that this has always been a part of human history. 
And no century is going to have the call as far as the best when it came to having a monopoly on death, disaster, terror. And each epoch has had this. So we have to use good discernment, good prayer, good spiritual directors, and stay focused and stay with Jesus in these times, most definitely, and pray to the Holy Spirit for discernment. Because we have a right to life and the defending of our lives and others, as you will see, see through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And then we're going to talk about what you and I can do to be a little bit better prepared, because we should be prepared. And then how do we prepare as Catholic Christians? So with that being said, October 16, 1991 was, just going to be a normal day for Susanna Hupp of Killeen, Texas. She was meeting her parents for breakfast at Louie's cafeteria. It was a practice that they had done frequently, and they looked forward to it. And as they were eating, a truck smashed through the diner, and a gunman exited the truck, and he began to open fire. And Susanna thought to herself, I got this guy because she always carried a firearm in her purse. But to her horror, she remembered she had left her firearm in her truck glove box. Now her father, being a brave man, he rushed the man, but he was killed. And as his wife held him and cradled him in her arm, the gunman also shot and killed her. Now, before that gunman killed himself, he had killed 26 and wounded 27. Now, Susanna, and one of the reasons that gun was in the glove box was the carry law in the state of Texas at that time, which prevented her from legally taking it in, not saying she wouldn't have, but she forgot it that day. But the law was against her. She was so taken up in what happened, and who wouldn't be that horrible, horrible day, that she became involved in the politics in Texas. She ended up serving five terms in the House of Representatives, and she advocated rights for self-defense. And she was able to get a lot of uh, legal firearm protection and rights for people down there to protect themselves. Now, we both know that we've witnessed many, many more of these mass shootings since the year 1991. And as I mentioned earlier, with the coronavirus spreading, people are hoarding food, medicine, even toilet paper. And they cleaned out the gun stores. I was in uh, Cabela's, a store that specializes in outdoor stuff, and I saw these young guys getting bows and arrows. And I said, wow, that's, you, you see that once in a while. The three guys are the same kind. It's pretty neat. So I went upstairs. Not one box of ammunition was left. Everything was gone. And the guy told me, I said, yeah. I says, look at this. He says, yeah, they're starting to buy bows and arrows and even crossbows. And I'm thinking, my gosh, my gosh, they're doing this to protect themselves in their homes. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 39, the Lord is telling people in that particular gospel to turn the other cheek. And that fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments says what? Thou shalt not kill him. So the question arises right now, Catholics, Christians, and just people in general, how far can I go in protecting myself and not going against the God I follow? 
And I just want to point out, this is a very complex issue, very complex issue. And some people, they get angry at issues like this, and some won't. But it is a complex issue, and I've got to say to all my brothers and sisters that are Christians listening, as Catholics, this is, we are blessed because we have what we call the deposit of faith. And what the deposit of faith, for those who don't, are not familiar with it, is scripture, sacred tradition, and the teaching body of the church called the magisterium. It's called the deposit of faith. You see, as Catholics, scripture and tradition, we weigh hand in hand. They have equal weight when it comes to what we believe. And we believe that the Holy Spirit guides the magisterium, even sinners, that comprise it, because that's all members of the Catholic Church have one thing in common, and that's that we're sinners. We have that in common with all Christians also. But we have that to guide us, and it truly is a blessing. And then we have another thing called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So these are, for Catholics, our guides to truth, and moral questions in the times that we are living. They help us to discern God's will in our lives and the circumstances that we may find ourselves in, especially at this time. Now, think about it. We seem to live in an age where good is bad and bad is good, where truth is distorted, to say the least. And at worst, there is no truth, only what you make of it. Something that Pope Benedict the Sixteenth at that time had argued so much called relativism, a, a very, very dangerous thing in our time. Very dangerous. And this will pay out as time goes by how dangerous it will be or if we can defeat it. And that's why the church is a beacon of sanity when it seems as if the world has gone totally off kilter. Now, one thing I want to say to the Catholic Church is that it's always consistent from life issues, for instance, from the womb to the tomb. So what does our church have to say about protecting life or taking life through self-defense. Well, the doctors of the church, like St. Thomas Aquinas and our teaching magisterium, have made it clear that self-defense is not only right, but a duty. Now, one thing I want to make out crystal clear on the show tonight, we are not advocating violence in any way, shape, or form. And everything that I say will be a church teaching. So again, the church has made this clear from the likes of Thomas Aquinas to the magisterium that self-defense is not only right, but a duty. Now, the catechism of our Catholic Church makes it very, very clear that killing is always, even in war, a grave issue, and never, never, never to be taken lightly. Now, if you want to check that out, you can go to the Catechism and look at those chapters 2361 to 2262. And yet, the fundamental principle of morality, again, all this from the Catechism, is that love and preservation of oneself is a firm principle that we believe in. So we always look at killing as something grave, never to be taken lightly. But also the fundamental principle of that morality is that the love we have for ourselves, because we have to have that self-love, not selfish, but self-love, to love like ourselves so that we can turn 
and give that love to Christ and give that love to our fellow man. And we've got to be comfortable with who we are and how we love ourselves. And we have then the duty to preserve that life, that beautiful gift that Jesus Christ has given us. And we know this for a fact because Jesus himself has told us to love your neighbor as yourself. And again, if you don't love yourself, loving your neighbor means absolutely nothing. And when we're talking again about loving yourself, it's in that right ordered way, not selfishness. That instinct of self-preservation, that comes from the fact that God has given us this great gift of life, great gift. And therefore, you and I and every human being have a fundamental right to live, protect, and defend that life. Okay, you might say, well, that's all well and good. Well, what, is, what do they say about defending others? Well, absolutely. We absolutely have the right to defend the weak and the helpless. In fact, defending the innocent is not only a right, again, but a duty. Now, this doesn't just apply, as you might think, to law enforcement or military men and women. But as civilians, that's you and I, if someone is in a clear and present danger to others. So, again, not just military or law enforcement, but civilians. And the next question that is begged is, so can we ever justify taking human life? Now, there are good Catholics, and they have a pacifist bent, and it's fine, and they believe it is never justified. That's some of the beauty of our faith. That's some of the beauty of living in the United States of America. You can have that belief. But the, church, the answer that the church gives is that lethal force can be justified. The catechism says it can be justified if there is no other choice. Killing has to be a last resort after everything else has been tried. So everything, you've got to do everything in your power to not let this happen, to, to not kill, to run, do whatever you need to do, but give them the wallet, whatever. But it only has to be a last resort. There's no other option. Now, the Catholic Catechism also states Thomas Aquinas again, about using force that is proportionate to the violence being done. And this is important. Simply put, this means that you just can't go shooting someone for stealing your wallet. That's much more force, much more violence than is necessary. That wallet can be replaced, what's in there can be replaced, but human life cannot, even that uh, person that took it. Now, if someone attacked you, let's say with a knife, or your life, or someone else's, is in imminent danger, imminent danger, then lethal force is justified. That's what the catechism states. Now again, brothers and sisters, I mentioned this is a very difficult topic to discuss. Because love, compassion, and peace are what we should strive for. Violence only leads to more violence. It does. I think we've all seen that in our lives, it's some, in one, some way, shape, or form. This is the way that we bring about God's kingdom on earth, that way. However, we can't ignore the fact that we live in a world that has evil and violence in it, especially now with everything that's going on and people losing hope. They're depressed, not just adults, but young kids being out of school. Things are happening quickly. And you know, it also seems to be a paradox, doesn't it? We look at Jesus, and he lays down his life for us. But you see, no one took Jesus' life. Jesus laid down his life willingly for us. Now, we can give our lives as the martyrs did, and do, in this day and age right now. But you see, that's our choice. It's not forced upon us. 
And that being said, though, we can be justified when we fulfill our duty to protect our life, our families, and the innocent, because life was given to us by God, and no human being, no human being has a right to take that from us. And that's the difference. So that's what the church states. And that's something we want to be aware of. You know, um, I participated in the martial arts and uh, taught for quite a while, years. I still practice um, myself and uh, still train. So what I'll say now, I'll give you some pointers to be, you know, a real-world Christian, real-world Catholic because of that world, as I mentioned when we were talking earlier about violence in the world we live. There is evil. There is violence. You know from listening to the show that it's a supernatural battle. And one thing we have to realize, brothers and sisters, is Satan hates us. And he hates us where he wants to destroy us, kill us, tear us apart, our family, our loved ones, anything that has to do with God, including his creatures and creation. Make no mistake about it. Evil walks the world. And there is violence in the world. And we've got to be prepared because one thing, you know, some people say, well, you know, now you, you get kind of paranoid at times and things like that, thinking about things like this or, you know, protection of loved ones. And, but as I mentioned, I taught this for quite a while. And one thing I learned early on, early on in my career, that the people that came into those dojos were average people like you and me. They were just going about their business. And they were attacked violently. And they came in to learn how to defend themselves because they didn't want that to happen anymore. And it's probably safe to say that before that they didn't think too much about it, maybe as a passing thought, but it never really hit home until they had a violent encounter. In those days, in the early days, there were not many women that trained, not like now, and I think it's an awesome thing. I think all women uh, should have some type of form of self-defense, really. Uh, it's, it's a different world than the one our moms and sisters and everyone grew up in. It's much different. And with with the exception of one um, girl that came in at mine just to learn to fight, they were either attacked or raped. So my point is that they were just going about their business, living day-to-day life like all of us do, and all of a sudden it went topsy-turvy. <clears throat> so it can happen to anyone. Now, I mentioned with the firearms and everything going on, people hoarding. If you're going to take that track, you need to learn how to use it, brothers and sisters, and not injure an innocent or yourself or your family member. So just don't go out, panic attack, do something foolish, get caught up in all this stuff, and end up having a tragedy because you don't want that either. You know, from a... a, a livable, like I say, a, a practical Catholic Christian right now, give you some ideas on what you can do. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the spiritual nature of this, because that's the important one, believe me, is that spiritual one. Because again, this is all a supernatural war, and we're in a battle. And you, boy, I hope people can see this now. I should be opening and ears should be hearing. But <clears throat> we have a saying that the Highest form of self-defense is avoidance. That is the highest art. Now, what does that mean? That means something that we can all practice right now at this very moment, the minute you're done listening to the show. Number one is situational awareness. Now, what situational awareness is, is knowing who's around you and what they are doing. And that is critical, critical. Now, I'm not going to suggest, because you burn out in a New York minute, 
to be on a guard every waking moment of your life. You, you're, you can't take that kind of stress. But you want to have a certain level of awareness. So situational awareness would be if you – well, actually, let me give you a true story. Let me give you a true story. There's a woman who pulled up in a, to get gas at one of the convenience stores. Now, she was a businesswoman. She was decked out, an attractive woman. And she noticed two guys. And they were staring at her. That's common with guys looking at attractive women. And she had put the uh, gas into the uh, vehicle to gas up. When she noticed these two guys had hoodies on, they popped the two hoodies up. And then they started to look around. And she knew right then and there that they were coming for her. She just got in the truck, left the gas uh, nozzle in the gas, gas filler, and drove off. Now, that's situational awareness. She knew she was in trouble, and she got out of there. Didn't even put the handle back. She knew. She was aware, and she saved herself probably a lot of grief. So that's the type of situation of awareness that you should be aware of. If you went through that, let's say you were gassing up at a convenience store, two people went in, three people before you, you're out there five minutes, ten minutes, you know, maybe checking the tires, washing, and nobody's coming out, you need to be aware that something's going on. The one thing that you can do right away is to get in the habit, whether you're uh, male or female, of locking your car doors and your house doors the minute you're inside the vehicle and the minute you get inside your house. Now, I know that's aggravating. You come home, you've got bags of groceries, you leave the car doors open, you maybe have a groceries funneling with the keys to get in the car. These situations are what a predator will look for and home in on. And while you're fuzzling around with the keys, they can attack. When you're not locking your door, even if you've got five trips for that car and back to your house and you don't lock it each time, it's the one time that can catch you. So these are simple things, simple things. You should plan, brothers and sisters, if someone was following you, where would you go? If you know someone's following do you have a safe route on your way home from work? on your way to get gas, on the way to the library, on the way to the doctor. What if someone followed you and were following you? You certainly do not go home. Do you know where your police stations are? Fire stations are. All my convenience stores. Safe zones is what you want to look for. These are simple things that can help you very much. One thing you can do, uh, especially if you're female, do not, when shopping at the mall or, or wherever you shop, do not park away from the crowd, so to speak. Don't isolate yourself. But stay close. Stay close to where you exit and enter. And if you're concerned and you shop and it's getting late at night and there's not a lot of people around, wait till somebody also walks out. But someone that you're not apprehensive about. Stay in crowd because it's a lot easier to not be picked off as a victim. Much easier. Um, one thing, too, I would suggest, speaking uh, to a little sidetrack here, with, all, with the riots going on and the protests going on, do not let your curiosity get the best of you in these things. Uh, a friend of mine's daughter, they were rioting just below her apartment door the first day they went out to see what was going on. Wisely, the second time, he told her, whatever you do, don't go back out there because you can get caught up, caught up in uh, the mob. And police or the mob, they, especially with now we're required to wear a mask, they're not going to know who you are, that you're one of the good guys just seeing what's happening. And you could have yourself a world of hurt. So just avoid, avoid all those things. 
You want to use a good, good situal awareness. Speaking of which, one thing I'd like to mention um, for the ladies is that you, when a strange man or a stranger approaches you, and for instance, oh, it looks like you got your hands full, Miss. You, I, you know, I don't mind helping you carry a bag up to your apartment. Ladies, no means no, and that's your answer. Unfortunately, so many times, those that were raped, or worse, unfortunately, they didn't want to hurt that person's feelings. And that's easy for us as Christians because we want to be loving and we don't want to not trust people. But again, this is situational awareness. We're living in a, a different world right now. And I'm not trying to make anybody paranoid, but just aware so that you can go home and enjoy life and enjoy the good things that God has given us because you have a right to that as we discussed so far in the show. So let your no be no and make it forceful because one thing the predator does is he tries to engage in conversation. This also applies to men because that gives them control of the situation and you do not want that to happen. That's how you become a victim. Let them think what they want of you. But I mean that. Let your no be no. You don't want anybody helping up with your groceries. You don't want anybody helping you to fix your tire. No. Just be wise. And do not engage in conversation. Now, nine times out of ten, they're actually good people trying to help. But you have to be very discerning. And if your intuition, brothers and sisters, is telling you that something's wrong, listen to that. Because if the Holy Spirit is saying, giving you warning bells of your guardian angel, pay attention. Pay attention to those warning bells. There's a reason. So those are a few of the things you can do to help protect yourself right away. Now the other things is, is learning martial arts or self-defense. You know, you can, it's, it's a great thing. I, I highly recommend it. Again, I think all women, um, actually today I think everybody should take some type of self-defense, some type of form uh, of it. They're all good. It, it's the practitioner that makes the art work. So they all have something to offer. So look and choose carefully what you are looking for. One thing I might rec want to recommend is that you look for a self-defense art because, listen, those MMA tough uh, guys there and women are the toughest people on the planet. I have incredible respect for them uh, as they go out and, and do what they do to make a living or any of the so-called combat sports. But remember something, the street and the sport are not the same. So what I mean is if, if you were looking for a martial art and it just, you know, featured uh, sport karate, you know, going to tournaments and doing the point matches, things like that, just, that might not be for you. If it is, that's awesome. It's awesome. But if you're looking for self-defense for the street, you need to look at an art uh, that looks at that, like, you know, maybe Kenpo Karate, uh, Krav Maga is very popular. Some of the arts that feature self-defense, the Filipino martial arts, any of those are, are good if you're into that. Again, I just touch on this briefly since we're talking all about this. And I know it's a sobering topic. And I know it's a little different take on the show um, this time around. But I think it's very relevant because people are getting nervous. And as I mentioned, they're, they're, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear right now. And that can master us and can lead to, to tragedy. So we want to master this fear. And being prepared... Remember, one thing we, we knew in the self-defense business, still do, is that it's better to be prepared and never have to use anything than to not be prepared and the day comes where you have to have it. So be prepared if you can. And then the firearm thing, as I mentioned, if you are going to go that way, then by all means, a qualified instructor, yet the permit, the training, and train with that firearm. Don't buy one, put it in a drawer or wherever you keep it and expect when you're going to need it, you're going to be able to use that 
uh, efficiently and safely. That, that can get you into trouble. You need to be familiar with it and confidence in it. So, you know, that's that aspect of it. So just a couple pointers on, on what you can do right away. You know, don't put yourself in harm's way. If the Holy Spirit is urging you on that something's not right, listen to it. Listen to it. You can always catch another plane. You can always get another boat, a bus. You can always take a different taxi. You got to be very, very careful. You know, I, I heard of one story where I was a military guy actually um, over in the Middle East, where he had been many times before, and one thing he knew um, was that the once you came out of a hotel there, that the taxis would descend upon you, all asking and crying for your business. So one time he stepped out of a hotel and there was nothing. And he thought, he continued to watch. He said, I'll find one down line. He didn't put the two and two together yet. Moments later, he was out of the ring. A bomb went off. See, they knew there was going to be a terrorist attack. And he had, he had that inkling, but he kind of ignored it. That's, you know, the situa situational awareness uh, that you want to be aware of. And again, we, we don't want to encourage any violence or fighting, but, you know, sometimes sometimes in the world we live in, you have to fight. You have to fight to survive. And it's a sad state of affairs, but it seems to be getting worse. So, again, I don't want to put any paranoia on everyone or terror or fear, but, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to think about things like this and be prepared. Um, now, as far as, you know, with the, the preppers and things like that, you know, you and I as Catholic Christians, we've got a little different take on things like this. Because, as we just mentioned, we have the right to life because it's a gift from God. And we have a right to protect that life. And, and those around us, and those that are innocent, that can't speak. And that's not just aborted babies or the elderly who maybe have dementia and can't speak for themselves. That's all those so-called middlemen in between you and me and everybody else. Yet, it's good to prepare, you know, like during storms. We're told to have extra water, extra food, batteries, flashlights, candles, blankets if you're traveling, you know, you know, you know snow-covered snow mountain, extra, you know, first aid kits. We're always talking about things like this. We prepare for things like this, and that's a good thing. But I'm not talking about selling everything you have and heading out into the hills where you could survive just by yourself. Because as Catholic Christians, we mentioned earlier in the show that what we believe is that Jesus put each one of us in a particular age we're living now with a mission. And our mission is to bring about the kingdom of God, to worship God, to give him glory, bring others to him, show love to each other, and at the end, prayerfully and hopefully, we are with him in heaven. So if these are the end times, how should you may respond as Christians? Okay. Well, you can look at St. Peter. Because he said that the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. And the earth and the works that are in it will be what? Burned up. So what Peter is suggesting is, is here is that believers do not head for the hills or adopt, you know, a mentality that's going to be hooray for me and a heck with you. I'm going to build myself a fortress and there's nobody or anything getting in here and start doing what we're seeing. That stockpiling the food and the weapons and the ammunition and everything else. And in one case, I mentioned even bows and arrows and crossbows. Now, we know that things will be gone. Jesus talks about that. Everything will pass away. And we see that in our own lives. We've seen this, how fast life goes. One day you're a kid, next day you're an older man and woman. And people are holding the door open. You know, have a nice day, sir. Have a nice day, man. <laughs> it wasn't that long before we were holding the door, right? 
so we see so many good things we knew, so many good loved ones we knew, and they're gone. So with that in mind, that all this passes and we need to store our treasures for heaven, Peter tells us that we need to conduct ourselves in holiness and godliness, to look and trust in God. So as Catholics, it's not just about conduct. We're blessed to have the sacrament. We have the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ right here on earth at each Mass to fortify us, to let Jesus become, when we consume him, he becomes part of us each and every time. We have a beautiful sacrament of confession because there's not one of us that doesn't need confession. We all sin. We're all sinners. And the beauty of that act of, con- of confession is that all our sins are forgotten. We are cleansed. We are given absolution. We are filled with sanctifying grace. And we're fortified to go on and try again. Even if we fall again. Even if it's the same sin. We try and be better. Slowly but surely. If we really set our mind to it with this grace, we conform ourselves to God's will. We will. We can beat any sin and overcome any sin that we have in our personal lives. And then we want to love God and trust in God and trust in his mercy. Because remember during these times, remember during these times, and this is where faith comes in, and a strong faith, that God is in control of all this. He knows what's going on. He knows what's going to happen. And he's going to get good out of evil. That is the one thing. Try as Satan might. Try as the demons might. Try as those who work for him you, that they can't do that, but God can. God can, and we know this because we killed him, a human being, the worst thing we ever did. We killed our God on Good Friday, and yet he brought our salvation on Resurrection Sunday. So the worst thing we did turns into the best thing for us. Only God can do that. So we trust in his mercy and his holiness, and we have a faith Pray for this thing, because it's not easy. That even if it didn't turn out the way we thought it should, even if it cost us our lives during these end times, and we were persecuted, that we have the faith to realize that we will be with him. And that will be forever. This is one of the reasons the martyrs, and I mentioned St. Perpetual and Felicity, and the group that was marched into the Colosseum to be uh, killed by the animals, they stunned the crowd that were calling for their blood by their singing, and then later their courage in the face of this barbarism. But you see, they knew where they were going. They knew they would be with their Lord. And that's the kind of faith we want to pray to have. Because if it does come to that, that's what we want to do. Trust in our Lord that, yeah, maybe it's going to sting for a little bit. But as St. Paul says, passing over on the other side is just like a blink of an eye. And then we're there with him. If we give that life up as a martyr. you know. And as Catholics, we have purgatory, a great gift from God. If we're not ready in our lives here, and let's say it is our time, but we've got some, some stain of sin on us that will be purged in purgatory. And we know once in purgatory, yeah, there will be some suffering, but we're going to see God. That's a given. The souls in purgatory will see God. That's why it's important uh, to have masses set for your loved ones and friends. So what we want to do is get close to God during these times, trust in God and his mercy, Receive the sacraments, especially the confession, 
You couple that with the Eucharist. That's an incredible one-two punch here. And then we go out and we do good to other, others whenever and wherever we can. That's why I say, you know, you've got to be careful as Catholic Christians not to just say, well, you know what, I'm just going to live in my own fortress because we're not called to do that. We're putting a place and a time so that we can witness. And we don't want to be, and I'm not criticizing the people here to do that. I'm just saying that as Catholics, we need to be, we need to do a little more, even if it costs us big. Because we want to show Christ in our lives. And boy, when you're willing to give up your own life or spill blood for Jesus or pay a price of losing a job or whatever it is that stands up for faith, believe me, he knows. And he's going to repay you big time for any harm that was done here. So we want to step out. And we may very well, brothers and sisters, be that beacon of light to a world that's gone so dark, right? We may be the only Jesus they ever see by our actions. And those actions done in love and in service service? Wow. So we do these works of God, the corporal acts of mercy. They could be, you know, whether it's feeding the poor, clothing the naked, visiting those who are sick in prison, going to a cemetery, saying prayers for your loved ones. There are many acts of mercy that we can do. A smile to someone in that grocery line having a bad day. A hug or a touch on the shoulder when some people need it. You don't even have to say a word. So we take this opportunity and we try to bring that to all people, not just believers, but to non-believers too, because we are all broken. We're all children of God, trying, trying. Some of us don't recognize it yet. Maybe they won't, not until they meet him at their particular judgment when they pass. But we're called to do more. Yes, we can do more. And are required, as I mentioned earlier in the show, with a duty to preserve that life and those of the innocent. And not just as military police, but as a civilian, as a Christian civilian, a civilian that cares about his fellow man and knows that there is imminent danger. But the basic thing for us to do is to try and get our lives right in accordance with God. Because more than likely, this pandemic we're living through, these times we're living through, it's going to pass. There'll be a blip on our history eventually. Those are the odds, and they're good odds. And it doesn't change the fact, though, that we need to still get ourselves right with God. Because in the problems we have as human beings and our weakness is that when tough times come, people do turn to God. But then when it settles down, we tend to go back to our worldly ways and we kind of forget the things that we told God we might try to do or thank him for and, you know, maybe we're not going to start going to Mass again and things like that. We don't want to do that. We want to stay on the course. And if things don't go back the way they are, and we need a correction as human beings to be brought to our knees, to worship our Creator, to acknowledge Him and not throw Him out, then that faith and living in the Spirit are going to be incredibly important. Incredibly important. And we try to hold on to that so that we never lose our Lord and in turn lose our soul. But by trying to get right with God, even when we fail, and we will, we're human, we're weak, we're sinners, we're going to slip. We've got to just get back up like the saints did, dust ourselves off, and keep on moving forward to Christ, setting our face in, like the strength, as it says in Scripture, and marching toward Jesus. And you know, that type of atmosphere and when we have that kind when we're living by the spirit and we're living in faith 
We're going to get confidence. They're living in love. We're going to get confidence. You know what that's going to do? We're going to have confidence in Jesus Christ. It's going to overcome any fear we have. That's by St. Perpetual and Felicity and those martyrs. And the martyrs are able to do what they do because they know where they're going. They have that faith. They have that love and they have that courage. And they're willing to trade this life, and however brief it is, and however tough it is, for one of eternal joy. That's the kind of faith and confidence we want to have right now in these times. So despite all the depression we're hearing about, brothers and sisters, try to look at the positive signs here. Our Lord Jesus Christ has overcome all of this. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, now the odds again are going to go, we're going to go back to, you know, what we knew sometime. And maybe, maybe it will be changed a little bit. We don't know. But is this the end? Probably not. We mentioned at the beginning of the show some of the things that the people of that time must have been convinced was the end. And it wasn't. It was very difficult times, very tragic times, hard times, sad times, just like now. But it went on, and they survived. And so will we. But we need to keep our eyes fixed and focused on our Lord because he has overcome this. And when we put our trust in him, no matter what, and again, I agree, easier said than done, you're, we are going to have that peace and that comfort that overcome all this fear. And when we do that, we're going to have a lot of love and a lot of joy. And we're going to be able to bring that to others in a world that so desperately needs it, whether it's our family, friends, or just strangers, whoever. And we'll start to make this turnaround and to defeat Satan and all this evil that's going on. And we can count on that. We can count on that. So to sum it up, as Catholics, as Christians, we prepare, we be aware, and we trust in the mercy of God and live our faith. And we take all our sufferings, all our problems, and we give it to Jesus on the cross to use it for the salvation of the soul, to use it as he sees fit to get good out of any evil, no matter how bad it seems, no matter how little the light is flickering in the darkness, God will get good out of it. And not only here, but also in eternity for us, because that's why he came, to die for us so that the gates of heaven that were closed by the sin of Adam and Eve would be opened. What an incredible promise. What an incredible God. What a loving Father. And he's given us these fellow brothers and sisters and yes, some are martyrs called the saints that have lived through difficult times and some have given their lives but they're now with him. And they pray for us as we pray to them and ask their intercession. That is an army. That is being loaded with armament for the fight. That's what being a warrior for Jesus is. And remember, where we may lose a couple battles, we have won the war through Christ. We win in the end. Not the princely powers, not darkness, not Satan, not evil, not carnage, not death, not sin. He wins. And as a follower of Christ, brothers and sisters, that means you and I are prince and princesses of his kingdom. And we win. And we will reside in him, in his heavenly kingdom, forever and ever and ever. And for that, Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, good night, and God bless. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. 
Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.